I'm Saladin Ambar. Welcome to this moment in democracy. Today marks 21 years since the September 11th attacks on our nation. This episode is in remembrance of the lives lost and the tragedies that occurred on that day. The conversation you'll hear in a moment was hosted by the School of Arts and Sciences at Rutgers University, New Brunswick last year to mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Former Dean Peter March welcomed John Farmer and Ava Majelisi for a conversation reflection on 9-11. John Farmer is the director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics and served as the Attorney General of New Jersey at the time when the 9-11 attacks occurred. Ava Majelisi is the Associate Director of Eagleton's Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience. We thank the School of Arts and Sciences for partnering with us on the content of this episode. Thank you for tuning in. Here's John Farmer describing his time serving as Attorney General of New Jersey back in 2001. Yes, um, I was New Jersey's Attorney General on 9-11 and for the prior couple of years before that, and um, actually had my baptism of fire, so to speak, in emergencies early in my tenure when Hurricane Floyd hit and we had flooding similar to what we experienced last week. And um, it was uh, during that period of flooding that I realized the role that the attorney general had in emergencies. Um, every, every state's attorney general office is structured differently. In New Jersey, as you sit atop a really fantastic Department of Law and Public Safety, which includes this, the New Jersey State Police and within New Jersey State Police is the, is the uh, Office of Emergency Management. So when Hurricane Floyd hit and people started asking me questions about what they should do, I you know, had that feeling, you're asking me, <laughs> you know, and realized that I did have a role to play in, in managing emergencies and came to really rely on OEM. They, they were not located in a special building then the way they are now, where they are part of this, uh, one of the best fusion centers in the country at the time. OEM was in the basement of division headquarters in West Trenton. And um, they were just incredibly competent and just knew what they were doing. And I had a great comfort level working with them. But after, after Hurricane Floyd, I, I decided to get my FEMA certification in emergency management. So I would at least have some idea what I was doing. The other issue that dominated my term, tenure as attorney general was the racial profiling issue. And uh, we had over uh, a two and a half year period made uh, significant strides in addressing that, that issue and in rebuilding trust in some cases, building trust between uh, affected communities and uh, New Jersey State Police and other law enforcement agencies. So on 9-10, we were hosting a national conference on police community relations in Atlantic City. And uh, the first day had gone tremendously well. We had had panels of people who, you know, for the Black Ministers Council to the uh, Black Issues Convention to the Hispanic community on the same dais with uh, members of the state police and other law enforcement agencies that a couple of years prior, they really hadn't had much of a relationship with. So we had started rebuilding those relationships and building those relationships. And uh, we finished September 10th in a really upbeat mood and thought, you know, we're really turning the corner on this issue uh, and we're very optimistic. Uh, so the morning of 9-11, I was walking over to the convention center in Atlantic City uh, to start the second day of the conference. <clears throat> and um, when everyone's uh, pages went off, didn't have cell phones back then. Uh, some people had Blackberries. Most of us had pagers, but they, all the pagers started going off saying there'd been an accident at the Trade Center. And by the time I made it over to the convention center, the second plane had hit um, the second tower. So we knew that uh, we were under attack. And um, uh, so uh, we quickly uh, suspended the, the conference, uh, sent people home and raced up to division headquarters um, where we issued an emergency declaration, had the governor sign it. And again, you know, uh, OEM did a fantastic job drafting that order. My contribution up to the order was to expand the um, mobilization of hospitals and ambulances so that when we later that day, Jersey City was choked with ambulances from all over the state. Uh, I should have listened to the experts at OEM and and left it confined to the the region, the northeast part of the state. But that was my uh, my my initial mistake that morning was expanding the scope of the emergency order. Um, And so we had actually uh, had plans for an incident that might occur in lower Manhattan. Leap in the run up to the millennium and the Y2K issue, we thought there might be a terrorist attack in lower Manhattan coinciding with uh, January 1st. So uh, we had made plans to, uh, to use Liberty State Park as a staging area for uh, assistance to New York and also as a potential trauma center for victims of whatever might happen in New York. So we did have plans in place. That was the first time I remember hearing the name Osama bin Laden. 
uh, is the run up to uh, the millennium. Uh, and we put those plans into activation on 9-11 on and uh, from division headquarters. Uh, we jumped in a helicopter and flew to uh, Liberty State Park. And like, you know, one of those images that's ingrained forever. I never forget the sight of the uh, of the of the towers burning and um, this enormous pile, 40, 50 stories high of just burning rubble and, and thinking, you know, that 50,000 people work in the Trade Center. And this happened at rush hour, you know. Who knows how many people are perishing in there? Um, and, you know, as someone who was in charge of public safety in, in the state, that was a blow that I, I, to this day, carry with me, um, of feeling that, you know, how, how could this possibly have happened? So you mentioned some of the emergencies that you had to deal with leading up to 9-11. But as you were on board that state police uh, helicopter, looking down at the remains of the Twin Towers as the crisis unfolded, did you feel prepared for that moment and all of the moments that followed? You say uh, that you had certain plans in place, but did you feel prepared? Short answer is no. I mean, there was a lot of chaos that day, <clears throat> and, and that's going to be the case in, in a kinetic event like that. You know, we had plans that we could activate, uh, but, uh, you know, it's hard to, it's hard 20 years later to sort of recapture the, um, the fear um, that day that, okay, you know, they hit the trade center, they hit the Pentagon, there was a fourth plane down, what's next? Um, and so all these reports were coming in, um, you know, uh, most of them false, but you know, the um, reports about people in Central Park with explosive backpacks on, you know, and <clears throat> reports of Israeli commandos leaving the scene and reports of thousands of Muslims dancing in Jersey City and Patterson um, and, you know, we learned very early on, or I did very early on, to interrogate the source of those reports. You know, how do you know this? Who'd you hear it from? Before we start scrambling and sending resources to respond to things that are phantoms, let's try to at least establish that there's some credibility to them. Um, the report about Muslims dancing in Jersey City uh, had some uh, credibility for me because um, Jersey City had been the staging ground for the attack on the Trade Center in 1993. So we did send resources over to Jersey City to check it out. And um, uh, the report that came back to me was, was it was nothing, um, basically. Certainly not thousands of people dancing on the streets or whatever. But it also brought home to me very early on that uh, we had to do some outreach uh, to the Muslim community because um, uh, we would need their help and also uh, to tell them that we would not tolerate vigilante activity. So uh, the days after 9-11 were uh, a lot of visits to uh, homes and to mosques and to other uh, Sikh temples, um, synagogues, uh, trying to reassure people that we were not going to tolerate violence, um, so, you know, collateral to the Trade Center attack. So you get to Jersey City. What are some of the immediate first steps um, that you need to take to alleviate the fallout? And, you know, how does the rest of the day shape up for the attorney general of the state? So the rest of the day was we had a command uh, module set up and um, was working with Carson Dunbar, who was at the time uh, the colonel and superintendent of the state police and with Paul Zubek, who was my first assistant at the time and, and the outstanding people from OEM. And we were sending uh, Marine police boats uh, shuttling uh, back and forth from lower Manhattan, uh, bringing wounded people back and also bringing first responders over. It was communications were uh, very difficult because the, the state police radio tower was on was on the North Tower. And so that when the North Tower fell, we lost uh, the ability to communicate by radio and we've resorted to runners, um, just literally sending people physically back and forth uh, to try to gain situational awareness and figure out and coordinate what people were doing. So there was a lot of chaos. There were there were legal calls that had to be made. You know, later that day, we got a request from the federal uh, FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, to have the state police uh, search the um, the garbage of the airport hotels near Newark, which sounds like a pretty easy thing to do until you realize that you know New Jersey had a state uh, state versus Hempley, a Supreme Court case that unique in the country that had declared that people have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the contents of their garbage. So uh, we had a little hiccup over that, and and you know I dictated a short memo to the file, basically predicting that that if this if the situation were to come before the court in the context of a terrorist attack that doesn't involve residential garbage, but hotel garbage, they would distinguish state versus Hempley. And so we let the state police, uh, we freed them to do that. It was um, a lot of uh, trying to figure out what was happening in New York. The mayor was trapped for several hours and we couldn't find him. 
and the um, the upper levels of command of the fire department was was essentially um, destroyed. Um, you know, died in the died in the uh, collapse. And I remember one incident where they brought the body of one of the fire chiefs across to New Jersey by mistake, um, and um, and he was sitting on his body was laid on the dock, and uh, New York. New York folks came over and said, we got to have him back. And there was a little kerfluffle about that because once he's, once he's sort of in New Jersey, he's, he's ours. And so we had to, again, sort of bend the rules a little bit and just uh, dictate a memo to the file that that was a mistake in delivery. And we were refusing delivery on behalf of the state of New Jersey so we could be sent back. But I would say that the big challenge of the day was, uh, was establishing communications that worked, um, establishing connectivity with the response in New York, and figuring out uh, how we could help. So I'd like to fast forward to the 9-11 Commission. Uh, Ultimately, you served as senior counsel and team leader for the 9-11 Commission from 2003 to 2004. How did that opportunity arise for you? So um, my interest in it dates from 9-11 itself when, you know, this is happening and I'm thinking, how in the world did this happen? How did it come to this? or in sort of military parlance, whiskey, tango, foxtrot, you know, <laughs> what, what just happened? Uh, so I had an, a, an abiding curiosity about to, to understand what we all went through. And it took a couple of years. Initially, the Bush administration was opposed to creating the commission. They thought it would be a distraction from, from fighting the war on terror, and, and, um, and then were opposed to it. Um, it was really the, the efforts of the victims' families that pressured the administration and Congress and ultimately, they relented and, and formed the commission. The initial appointment of the chair of the commission was Henry Kissinger, and um, the families objected to, to his appointment, and I think rightly so, because he has a consulting company that has a deep reach into so many secure, uh, security agencies around the, around the world uh, that there were potential conflicts there. So the Bush administration then turned to Governor Kane, uh, former Governor Kane of New Jersey, who I never worked for directly, but I got to know during my time uh, in the Whitman administration as uh, you know, her chief counsel and then as AG. And I, I had taught uh, and lectured at, at Drew University where Governor Kane was the president. And, um, and he asked me if I was interested in, in, in uh, participating in the investigation. And I said, absolutely, I would love to do this. So tell me a bit about uh, your day to day. What was your charge? What was your what was your mission? What was your day-to-day like in that role? So the team that I led, again, really strong, fantastic people. Uh, we were charged with um, with basically piecing together the chronology of 9/11. You know, uh, the day itself, uh, who did what, when, and uh, from the from the hijackers, you know, getting on the planes through uh, the end of the response or the the end of the uh, the attacks and the and the and the follow up to that. And then we were charged with evaluating the state of our uh, nation's emergency preparedness, you know, after the attacks and currently back then, and looking at the private sector as well. Uh, because one of the things that we we found in the early in the early days after 9/11 was that uh, we knew that a significant amount of the critical infrastructure of our state is in private hands, but the state of New Jersey had no inventory of that. And um, and so uh, what we did was. We took the division of law, you know, six, 650 lawyers or so, and, um, and part of the division of criminal justice. And we basically had them fan out over the state and make, it, and make that, create that index of critical infrastructure so that we would at least know of where the potential vulnerabilities were. And, um, uh, and so that was part of the charge with the commission as well, is to sort of evaluate what are the standards of, of care that are involved in the private sector which controls so much of our critical infrastructure. So, so the challenge of the investigation was, uh, I thought the the hard part was going to be piecing together the the events in New York and the towers and who did what, when that turned out to be, it was complex and there were a lot of interviews involved, but the stories were lining up um, and, and they were uh, pretty consistent. Uh, The the, the challenge turned out to be the national response. uh, And that surprised me because uh, because there had been congressional testimony about that. There had been TV specials about that where people had testified about it. And as we, as our team fanned out and started interviewing different responders, uh, the military, uh, air controllers, the FAA folks, the stories weren't matching what had been told to the public. So, uh, so my, my daily routine, I was splitting time between our New York office and Washington office. And I was, um, very much involved in 
the national um, the national response story because that's where there seemed to be a discrepancy between what had been told and what we were and what, and what we were finding. So it's a lengthy report and rightfully so. But what were some of the commission's key findings that you can share with the audience? Well, in terms of in terms of my team's work, um, we did highlight the discrepancies that um, had had arisen between what the administration had been telling the public and what was true. Um, you know, what they had been telling the public was that the first two planes were a shock and a surprise, and there was no way to react in time for them. Uh, but that they had narrowly missed interdicting uh, American Airlines 77, which hit the Pentagon, and that they were effectively lined up on United 93 and had that plane come closer to, to the nation's capital, they were, they were prepared uh, to take it out. Um, the reality that we found was that um, they had a, a couple moments notice, not of American 77, but of a plane near the Pentagon, uh, and really weren't a, not, not in a position to take it out. And and they, the military air controllers learned about um, United 93 four minutes after it had already crashed. So there was a significant discrepancy there. Our report highlighted that. Uh, but I think in looking back from 20 years, I mean, the, the report uh, outlined several major reforms um, of emergency management that, that could be undertaken. Um, most of them have been. Um, we recommended the adoption of the incident command system, uh, which, which establishes unified command in, in, the, in the event of a kinetic event. Um, and that, that's been adopted pretty widely. We recommended that, um, that uh, a standard of care be adopted for private sector companies um, uh, that would expose them to liability um, if, if, they, if they did not have some kind of preparations in place um, for an emergency like 9-11. One of the things our interviews disclosed was that the companies uh, that did have some plans in place and that had drilled for, for having to evacuate the towers, um, their employees uh, did better in terms of getting out and knowing what they were doing than the ones which hadn't. Uh, so, so those were adopted. But the overarching conclusion of the report, and, and this is what I think resonates today, uh, is, is that America had an obligation to do two things strategically. One, degrade the capacity of Al-Qaeda and similar um, terrorist organizations to, uh, to strike at our homeland in a, in a major way like 9-11. Uh, and two, um, we had to win the, the war, the battle of ideas, the battle of ideologies. And, you know, I think what's, what's happened uh, over the 20 years, and this is a generalization, but, but some of the tactics that we employed to address the first issue, to degrade the terrorist capability, have compromised our ability to win the second the second phase, which is the battle of ideas. There are parts of the commission's report that are almost painful to read in retrospect, uh, where the report recommends that, um, that America hold itself out as a moral example to the world and, and promote values like um, civility and uh, openness to opposing views and, um, and, and open dialogue and, and things like loyal opposition it's painful to read now because it seems like an artifact from a, a long gone era. I mean, it's those, those qualities have vanished from our own politics and uh, it makes it, you know, almost impossible for us to project that image when we're not following it ourselves. So following your service on the 9-11 commission, you wrote the ground truth, the story behind America's defense on 9-11, uh, which was named a New York times notable book after its 2009 publication. What are the key takeaways from that book? And if you could similarly um, answer whether those issues that you point out in the book, have they been addressed? So I had two uh, motivations for writing the book. One was to highlight the, um, uh, to highlight the uh, misleading story uh, that, that the administration had told about the response, because I thought that uh, at some level, that misleading uh, uh, account uh, caused them not to not to address um, some of the flaws in the response. Um, you know, the, the way the response played out, you had basically uh, you had different levels of the government talking only to themselves um, and and nothing really reaching the ground uh, in a way that was operational. Uh, and so, what ha what had to happen that day is everyone had to just sort of that's just sort of abandoned whatever plans they had for hijackings and for uh, and for events like that, uh, and just improvise. Uh, 
And I thought by not being forthright about what had happened, it really prevented them from thinking more imaginatively about future crises. And, and then when Hurricane Katrina happened, again, it's a completely different event. Um, 9-11 was a surprise. Um, it, you know, it was, um, caused the government to improvise. Hurricane Katrina, though, was something the government had been planning for. In fact, when I got my FEMA certification, the closing exercise was a Category 3 hurricane hitting New Orleans. i never forget it, which is exactly what happened. But when you studied Katrina, when you looked at Katrina, uh, the, same, the same mistakes um, were recurring. Um, the different levels of government were, were the top officials were talking to themselves and they were directing things that they were assuming were reaching the ground in New Orleans and none of it was. So the people on the ground in New Orleans, much like we had to on 9-11, you know, we're essentially making it up as they went along uh, and they had to improvise that response. So um, I thought that was a compelling comparison and, um, and it really shed light on, I think, a flaw in the way that, that, that plans are made for these kinds of, of contingencies uh, that you, you have to not only imagine the nature of the event itself, you have to also imagine how you're going to have to respond to it um, and not just simply overlay uh, an organizational chart you know, on the, on the response and say, well, the president has to do this and the vice president has to do this when, in fact, there is not going to be time. Um, so that, those are my motivations in writing that book. And um, to your question about, you know, has it, has it been fixed? You know, I see some real parallels um, in terms of the COVID response. Uh, just to give you just one, the decision by the CDC in the spring of 2020 not to test uh, people who had been exposed to infected people, but who were not symptomatic. And the reason for that they, that they gave was that, you know, typically in coronaviruses, they're not transmissible unless uh, they're symptomatic. But as they later acknowledged, uh, Dr. Redfield later acknowledged, they missed over half of the cases because of that decision. And so, you know, just like the hijacking protocol on 9-11 uh, called for, you know, called for a process of moving up the chain and made some assumptions about what hijackers were going to do, it turned out not to be true. The thought was that hijackers would uh, seek to land the planes and have political demands met. And, and so when they turned off the transponders in the planes and disappeared into the radar clutter and then used them as weapons, the protocols that were in place were completely inadequate to the task. Well, in a similar way, once, you haven't, once you're not testing uh, half of the infected people, uh, you know, your, your protocols are just not simply not going to work. And so it's again, it's, it's the hardest thing in the world to 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 imagine every possible scenario. But when the consequences are so catastrophic, I think it, re, it requires planners to consider who's going to have to make the critical decisions if this happens and and to practice that. So just so our audience is aware, I do see the Q&A popping up. There is a lot of overlap with the questions that I've prepared. So I'm interspersing uh, as we go along. Can you explain uh, for our audience how the terror threat has evolved since 9-11? Is the U.S. prepared to prevent and or mitigate these threats? Um, you know, I've got questions popping up, you know, with the 20th anniversary coming up. Is there a threat of another 9-11 style attack on the United States, in your opinion? Well, so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely true that the threat posed by Al Qaeda itself has been significantly degraded. Uh, they still exist um, as an organization. They would certainly like to come back <laughs> to the strength that they had uh, at 9-11. But I think that their, you know, their top leadership has been eliminated in the, in the person of Osama bin Laden. And, and so, so that, that threat is, I think, degraded to an extent. The ISIS threat, um, I think, has been degraded to an extent. But the ideologies are still out there and they still have adherence and, and we shouldn't kid ourselves that there aren't uh, people uh, organizing to try to, to, to hurt us. I think, I think law enforcement and our um, armed services have done, have done a, a terrific job in improving uh, communication among agencies and in, in their, their capacity to interdict these threats as they arise. But I think the overall threat picture is, is more complex because not only do we have not only do we have um, uh, Islamist terrorist groups um, that are still out there and still would like to do us harm, but we also, uh, we also have seen the rise of domestic extremist groups, you know, fueled and accelerated by social media, 
and um, and they also pose a threat, uh, both on the extreme left and on the extreme right. Uh, ironically, as, you know, I don't know if anyone saw these reports, but some of the far right extremist groups were actually applauding the Taliban uh, because they ac- actually share some of their social agenda. Um, so I think the threat is more complex now and will require law enforcement uh, to be and the government to be very nimble in trying to, to cope with them. Um, and the, the accelerant of social media is something that has emerged in the last few years where it's so much easier now for like-minded extremists to find each other. And that's a, that's a troublesome development. And I'm not sure that you can fix it simply by deplatforming people because they go, can go to the dark web, they can, they can become encrypted, and then they might even be harder to track. Um, so I think we're much better prepared for a major terrorist attack um, than we were. But we're operating in a much more complex uh, threat environment than we were. So let's turn to the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. By some estimates, the U.S. has spent over $2.3 trillion on the war in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Those costs include tens of billions of dollars to train and equip Afghan security forces who collapsed within days under Taliban pressure. What are your thoughts on the length of time the U.S. spent in Afghanistan? Should we have remained there for 20 years or should we have left after Osama bin Laden was captured and killed in 2011? What are your thoughts? Well, I think the nation building in which we engaged, and you can second guess it now, obviously, because it didn't work. Uh, but the nation building in which we engaged was was really a, a part of our effort to address that second strategic prong. In other words, if we could if we could stand up uh, some a, a model of, of democracy and promoting women's rights and, and education and in a, in a place like Afghanistan, um, it would go a long way toward winning that war of ideas. I think the I think the level of corruption was um, was underrated. But I also I also am mindful of General Petraeus, who I saw interviewed recently, who uh, took sharp exception to um, uh, to the administration's statement that the you know, the Afghans weren't fighting for their country. Um, you know, General Petraeus's point was that we had, you know, little more than a garrison there in recent years, and um, and they had lost tens of thousands of people fighting for their country. In his view, um, our decision to withdraw air support uh, was was um, undermine their own confidence in their ability to 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 counteract the Taliban, and our and our uh, the prior administration's decision to negotiate with the Taliban and not include the Afghan government could only have served to undermine uh, the people's faith in that government. So it's an, it's not resolved in my mind, you know, uh, whether it was a, whether it was a waste. I mean, I think, I think there has to be uh, over a 20 year period. And I think you're seeing that in some of the protests that are being suppressed now, but uh, particularly among the women of Afghanistan, there's going to be a lot of resistance going back to the way things were. And I don't know what form that's going to take and how effective it will be. Uh, but I think that that's a, that's something that we should support. And, and you know, uh, John McCain gave a speech I, maybe 10 or 12 years ago where he said, look, if you're going to go, if you're going to nation build in a place like Afghanistan, you can't, you can't affect those kinds of cultural changes in a decade or two. You know, and, and in his view, I think he said it would take a century or more. Uh, and maybe that calculation would have, if they had thought in terms of a century, they might not have decided to nation build there. But I think it was I think it was done for the right motives, um, but it turned out, you know, not to work. And I think the end at the end game was um, very hard to watch um, for those who for those who were there on 9-11 and um, knew that the Taliban was just, you know, actively supporting Al Qaeda and thumbing their nose at at our attempts to to stop Al Qaeda. Uh, So uh, my hope is that 20 years of living in the mountains of Pakistan, um, May have may have soured some of them on the idea of becoming of harboring terrorists, but um, but I think it was I think the nation building was too expensive, and uh, it's very unfortunate how it ended. And I hope my hope is that is that uh, positive change can still happen in Afghanistan. I don't think anybody believes the Taliban will win an election there. So the question is going to be will the will the people tolerate their rule again? And that's an open question. So a recent New York Times opinion piece argues that America's military is way too big. The author claims that America's military dominance hasn't yielded the promised results, citing not only the current withdrawal from Afghanistan, 
but expensive, decades-long conflicts in Vietnam, Lebanon, and Iraq, among others. What are your thoughts? Should we reimagine the role of the United States military? Uh, Should the U.S. revert back to a more isolationist approach to foreign policy and avoid entanglements overseas? Is that even possible? I guess that's another way of, of, of asking the question, what's our place in the world? My own view is that isolationism is impossible for us simply because our, our, our economic interests are worldwide. And so our presence is going to be worldwide, even if our, our government is, is, trying to, is trying to deny it. And, and that worldwide presence makes us a potential target. You know, did we need 700 military bases around the world on 9-11? I don't know how many we have now. You know, probably not. I think um, uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense in which once you become so big, you, you, you lose your ability to be nimble and to, and to react to threats as they evolve. Uh, and there's also the sense that I've gotten doing some work in the Middle East with um, General Jones um, a number of years ago and also in Armenia um, that we, we turn to the military too quickly uh, in situations where soft power would be uh, just as effective, if not more so. And that, and that may require a readjustment, a reallocation of resources. But I think we have to have a strong military. I think we have to have a military that evolves with the times. Um, one, of the, one of the curiosities about, about our military that, that we found in, in the 9-11 Commission investigation is we have some of the most advanced technology in the world um, and spend a lot of money on it. Um, but, you know, on, on the day of 9-11 in the, in the National Command Center, they were using, you know, they were using like old fashioned phones. I mean, you know, rotary phones. I mean, so... So right-sizing the military is a challenge uh, in, you know, in, in any era. Um, but I think, I think a, some kind of realignment towards soft power is probably in our interest. So before we get to audience questions, I want to make sure we touch on your transition to Rutgers. Uh, you've continued to develop, project, to develop projects and programs here at Rutgers that impact national security. Uh, So I'm thinking about the minor and critical intelligence studies through our political science department. You played a major role in securing the federal grant funding to support the creation of programs to educate the next generation of diverse, highly skilled students who are thinking about careers in the intelligence community. In light of all of the knowledge and expertise that you've gained since 9-11, what advice do you have for students who are pursuing this path and thinking about careers in national security? Well, I think the I think the advice that I would have is to be critical. You know, we've had we've had intelligence failures of major proportions in the past and blunders, and and um, and we've done some things that that cut against that that second strategic uh, strategic objective, which is you know to make sure that the American idea is the idea that prevails. So one of the purposes in, in developing this minor was, A, to make the intelligence communities more diverse than they have been, but also to educate students to go in with a critical eye toward what they're asked to do and to, and to challenge some of the assumptions that may have been made in the past. Uh, one, of the, one of the sort of um, harrowing moments after 9-11 was the realization um, after several conference calls with you know people very high up that they really didn't know a whole lot. And how is that possible, given the investment of trillions of dollars in this far-flung uh, early warning system that was supposed to, to be in place so we'd never have another surprise attack like Pearl Harbor? You know, how do we know so little? And look, it's, intelligence is a very hard, it's a hard field. It's a hard uh, area to get into. Uh, because you're constantly having to balance American ideals with the need for information, and that and that's a challenge, and 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 we have too often in the past you know, not met that challenge correctly. But but I think we do need to know uh, who our enemies are, and we do need to know uh, about people who want to attack our country, and and so I think it's an essential component, uh, and I think we can improve it uh, by making it younger, by making it more diverse, and by making the people who enter it. Um, Uh, you know, uh, view the assignment with some degree of skepticism. So I'd like to turn to the work that you've done with the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience. You've helped bring vulnerable communities from across the globe and the police who serve them together in an effort to better protect those communities from targeted violence and mass casualty attacks. Tell us what role the Miller Center was able to play in building these relationships where they didn't necessarily exist and how it's created safer communities. 
so thank you for that question. The, the Miller Center, really, the premise of it is that um, we have now, we now live in a world uh, of uh, many diaspora communities. Um, you know, historically, the Jewish, the, the Jewish community was the signature diaspora community, the original one. Uh, but the demographic trend in the world is that for more and more um, people from different countries uh, to be mobile. And, and so you're looking at a, a world where some estimates are a billion people in the world are living in, in nations where they were not born. Um, and, and so that over time, over history, it's shown that that, that makes them vulnerable. And they're seen as the other uh, by the larger community and, and law enforcement reflects the larger community. Um, and, and the majority community. And so um, the thought was that, you know, we would go into places where there were these vulnerable communities, vulnerable populations, and uh, through our connections with law enforcement, uh, try to build a bridge uh, between communities. So we, so we did a lot of work in Europe early on. I had a sabbatical where I was teaching at the University of Paris. And, and so we, we did a study of the uh, security measures that the Jewish communities in Europe had undertaken. They're the original diaspora community. They have survived in a very hostile environment for centuries. So the thought was, you know, what, what they're doing is something that could be a model for others. And as a consequence of that work, when the terrorist attacks happened in Brussels at the subway and the airport, um, we were actually invited in by the, by the Brussels uh, police and the Jewish and Muslim communities to come in and try to, and try to start building that bridge um, of communication very similar to the situation that existed in New Jersey back in the 90s, where just over time, um, relations had, had deteriorated and, and there wasn't a lot of communication going on. It's building that communication that is the vital step. Uh, and so for us to be successful in any, in any situation, there has to be a willingness, there has to be a recognition of the need for change. That's, that's what happened in Brussels. You know, once the attacks happened in the subway and at the airport, I think they knew that they had a problem. And, and um, so we, uh, we went over there and we recorded uh, nearly 30 hours of interviews of, you know, people on the street from kids in the, in the largely Muslim Molenbeek district uh, to commanders of the police. And, and, um, and, and we basically interwove those videos into a sort of provocative workshop that we put on first just for the police so that they would have a chance to see what the community thought of them and what they thought of themselves. And then ultimately uh, in the community center in Molenbeek with the police and community together. And so we started building um, those bridges. And since then, you know, we had a, a situation in Whitefish, Montana, uh, a few years ago where there was a threatened neo-Nazi march. And, um, and Paul Goldenberg from our, our center, who was also at the time in charge of the um, Secure Communities Network for the Jewish community, went out there. And, um, and they were petrified. Uh, and so we developed from, for Whitefish uh, some resilience training that brought together the, the very small police department that they had, you know, maybe a dozen people uh, with uh, statewide law enforcement, with um, the, lo the regional hospitals that might be needed in, in the event of an emergency, and again, developed a workshop for them. And so it's that kind of work uh, that builds those bridges of communication that offers the best hope uh, for vulnerable populations moving forward, because they're everywhere now. We've also visited uh, the Sikh community in Milwaukee, which was the victim of a mass shooting. And, um, you know, churches down south as part of a DHS uh, task force uh, where there have been church burnings in, in Mississippi. And, and um, uh, so that the thought is that, you know, uh, as the demographics of the world change, so has to our, our approach to uh, policing vulnerable populations. And we have to be better than we've been in the past. Uh, one additional question for you about the Miller Center. Since March 2020 and our transition to remote learning, the Miller Center made a decision to pivot to more research-based efforts, uh, including an ongoing collaboration with the Network Contagion Research Institute to help profile and report on emerging threats of extremism and terror forming on social media, as well as the creation of a pandemic task force to execute in real time an ongoing strategic assessment of the U.S. response to the pandemic at both the federal and state levels. Can you tell us a bit more about the current state of those efforts? Yeah, so, so our, uh, our work in the, in the Miller Center had been, and this was an understanding from the beginning, that we were not interested, uh, we were not interested in, in uh, conference world, so to speak. Uh, we'd all done that before. Um, you go travel around and it's a lot of fun and you, you give the same speech in several different conferences and 
and not a whole lot changes. We wanted to be we wanted to be a place that would actually go into communities and make a difference on the ground um, in individual circumstances. Um, obviously, once COVID hit and we had to lock down, we had to, we had to pivot in some way. And uh, I had gotten to know uh, Dr. Joel Finkelstein um, at Eagleton. We had we had done a um, a session there about the challenge that the military and law enforcement face uh, from social media extremist recruitment uh, in, from among their ranks. And uh, Joel presented at that meeting, and we talked afterwards, and 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 sort of struck up a a friendship and a partnership, and re- rewrote uh, a, a couple of you know groundbreaking reports from about a year and a half ago. The first one on the Boogaloo Boys, um, in February, I think, before the lockdown actually happened, that was our first report. And then once lockdown happened, we our work became more intense, and um, we wrote a report about uh, the QAnon phenomenon in June of 2020 forecasting its potential for violence, uh, for violent conduct. And, um, and we since co-authored um, and worked on reports uh, about uh, far left extremism uh, in Portland and Seattle and in other uh, areas of the country on the rise of anti-Asian hate. And our focus in all this is the abuse of social media uh, and its role as an accelerant to extremist conduct um, and extremist beliefs and and extremist products, because when you're doing this research and you're, you're you know, you're researching the Boogaloo Boys, which which who fancy Hawaiian shirts and, and some crazy patches, suddenly you have ads popping up on your computer for Hawaiian shirts and for camouflage and for quasi military equipment. So the application, the overarching problem here is the application of of commercial algorithms to political speech uh, has been a truly noxious development. And, and um, uh, e-commerce works because they, they drive you further and further in the direction of your preferences. But apply to politics, uh, driving you further and further in that direction drives you more and more to the extremes. And that's, that's a structural problem in our country um, that has, that has uh, accelerated the polarization that was already happening. So, um, so that's been a, a, a truly fruitful um, partnership we've had. With Joel, who's now a, he was at Princeton University when we started. He's now a, a senior research fellow at at the Miller Center. And the other major research undertaking we, we took when we pivoted was um, under the directorship of uh, Dr. Ron Clark to to basically do a state by state, um, a governor by governor assessment of the COVID response. And um, we're a team from Eagleton in the Center for the American Governor uh, is writing a book on the COVID response, and we're using. Uh, among other sources, uh, that data uh, set that we've been compiling, and we're we're uh, closer to, to posting it online. We we are still refining it, but but you know what what it what it shows is again uh, coming back to the idea of, of failures of the imagination. I mean, we know we've known for decades that pandemics don't respect political boundaries. Um, I think the assumption has always been that you could contain it within a state. And so therefore the governor is the right person to be making these calls. Uh, and that's the model that we have in the US. But what happens when you lose containment, which we did instantly when we failed to test. Um, but what happens when you lose containment is you have 50 different governors making 50 different decisions uh, and an absence of coordination. And, um, and that's plagued our response um, really from, from March of last year. Once containment was lost, you know, it doesn't make any sense to have 50 different approaches. And Dr. Fauci has actually said that um, uh, at the beginning of 2021. But my question is, okay, if we knew that, then why wasn't that reality baked into the planning for a pandemic? Like once you lose containment, shouldn't the model change? And we're stuck with a model that doesn't work um, in a pandemic that's out of control. So thanks for answering my questions. Um, I've been monitoring our audience questions as we've gone along. Uh, And I've gotten a question about the events that took place on the Capitol on January 6th. So do you see any parallels between the lessons that we presumably learned on 9-11 and the events that took place on January 6th? Well, you know, without I don't know much. I don't know much more than anyone else. I've been just having watched it and been completely shocked by the violence um, and by the the, this, this, the spectacle of, of uh, you know, American citizens breaking into our own capital and, and putting up a gallows with a noose, uh, supposedly for Vice President Pence when he wouldn't uh, suspend the um, certification of the election. Uh, 
you know, some of the articles that have appeared uh, since then, um, look, if you just in terms of calling up the National Guard, the protocol they had in place would have required four different sign offs. Well, you don't know, you're not going to have time in a real event to have Nancy Pelosi and, and other lead and Mitch McConnell and everybody sign off on calling up the National Guard. That's got to be somebody's responsibility if, if there's a mob of people trying to break into the Capitol. Um, so I, I think there are some emergency response type uh, parallels to, to the 9-11 event. You know, we'll never know whether the ultimate target of United 93 was the Capitol or the White House. I, I tend to think it's the Capitol because that's an easier target. Um, but it's ironic that, you know, the Capitol was not attacked by foreigners. It was attacked by, it was attacked that day by Americans. And um, um, that seemed to me the, the closest thing to a sacrilege that we have in our country is, is, is doing violence to our capital and really something that um, should be a source of shame for people, in my opinion. So I've had a few questions about uh, the unlawful surveillance of Muslims uh, in the aftermath of 9-11. Do you have any thoughts on that or anything you can share with the audience? Well, I think, you know, as I, it's part of, it's part of um, the answer I gave earlier that I understand because I was part of law enforcement, the fear, right? And the, the, the total loss of confidence uh, in our intelligence capability and the idea that we didn't know who might be a friend and who might be a foe. Um, and so I think that in response to that fear, um, there was an overreaction. And, um, and I think it did, it did tremendous damage um, uh, to relationships um, between and among American Muslims and law enforcement. I think a lot has been done to, uh, uh, to improve that over the years, but I, there's no question that in the early days, it was very difficult. I mean, one of, one of my missions in the immediate aftermath, the weeks after, after 9-11, uh, was, you know, I think that uh, Bob Cleary, who was the U.S. attorney at the time, and myself, and Kevin Donovan from the FBI, and, and Carson Dunbar from State Police, I think we visited every mosque, at least in the northern half of the state, and, and maybe in the whole state. Uh, and we had basically two uh, messages. Um, one, we are not going to tolerate vigilante violence. And there was, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, several incidents. Um, I think a, a, there was a Sikh individual who was killed in, in Arizona. And there were uh, reports of attacks. And um, I actually went to the length of recording a public service announcement, basically saying, we are not tolerating violence against religious groups of any type uh, in response to this. Uh, but the second part of the message was, you know, we need your help. Uh, we clearly didn't know what was going on. And, and, um, and, you know, that's on us, but it's also on you that, um, you know, we need your help in, in identifying people who might be threats to our country. Um, and I think some fruitful relationships, you know, did arise out of those, those meetings. And, um, and I think a lot has been done to, to sort of ameliorate that, uh, that conduct. But there's no question that there was some overreach and it was the product of uh, fear and ignorance. It was not knowing what the next shoe was going to be. Was there going to be a, a second wave? Was there going to be uh, was there going to be some other form of attack? And as you recall, within weeks of 9/11, the anthrax attacks happened. And of course, of course, the letters were mailed from from New Jersey, so we were in the center of that as well. Uh, so, uh, and we didn't not we didn't know that the, the writer of those letters purported to be uh, uh, an Al Qaeda sympathizer. Uh, so we did not know what the next attack was gonna be and who the target was gonna be. We knew that they tried to decapitate our government and our financial system. Uh, so they were, they were making an existential threat to the United States. And I think the, um, uh, the overreach that occurred was a consequence of that fear and ignorance. So I think we have time for one more question uh, and it's a big one. So I'll leave you with this. Uh, how can the extreme polarization and abundance of misinformation in our country be overcome what do you see as the future of our democracy? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean that. that's a serious question uh, that doesn't deserve a lighthearted response. Um, so where do we start? So I think um, it starts with self-awareness. You know, people need to be aware that they are being manipulated and that and that there are a lot of interests that have an economic stake in driving us further apart. And I would include social media. I would include cable news. I, I would include uh, journalists who get paid by the click, which, which encourages them to write, uh, to write more and more extreme headlines and extreme stories because, you know, that drives how many clicks you're going to get. And, you know, uh, 
it's like rubbernecking on a highway. You, you, you know, you, you're going to look at the accident, right? Like watching a train wreck. So I think it's got to start with the, the awareness that, that we, are being, we are being manipulated and we have to get our information from more than one source. Um, and we have to be critical of the sources that we do rely on. I think that we need structural change um, in terms of social media and maybe even um, um, cable news as well. You know, when radio came into existence, there was a recognition of the dangers of it um, in terms of propaganda. And the Nazi regime in Germany was the perfect example of, the, of how you could use a sole source of information to twist a population's views and manipulate them. And so in America, there was, there was a recognition that we needed to, to regulate um, broadcasting. And so there was a fairness doctrine that was imposed and, and broadcast outlets were obliged to, uh, to give multiple sides of a question. With the advent of cable news, that went away. And so, uh, you know, where you had the networks which had, which were required to give multiple points of view, you now have you now have cable news outlets which have no such requirement, and may pay lip service to it, but they really don't. Um, and I, I think it applies equally to the right and the left. I think um, they they have agendas. There are stories you'll see on one that you won't see on the other for obvious reasons, and and the American public needs to start getting outraged about that and to, to, to tend to demand change. Um, I think that's the first step. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have repeats every time there's an election cycle, we're going to have a repeat of last year, uh, where one party is going to feel like it was stolen, uh, even when it wasn't, even when, even when you know, the, the margin of, of difficult, of, of a victory was pretty large. Um, you have a lot of people believing that, that President Trump won that election, and it's because they're getting all their information from a narrow source. And my, you know, my, I think this, the most important thing the individuals can do is get your information from multiple sources. I like The Economist. I recommend it to students because even though it, it's sort of, it's, it's, it leans, I guess, conservative, they're pretty balanced and they usually call themselves out for their biases, but outlets like that, um, which are flagging in, in public interest. And I think what has to happen for our democracy to survive uh, is um, we have to re we have to redefine a center uh, that will hold because we it, we will not survive if 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 everything is left to the extremes of, of both parties and and um, I think that's our challenge I think we're at a critical point in the history of our democracy and and the next decade will really determine which way we go and I, I hope it's back in the direction of the uh, practices that that the 9-11 report um, thought we should highlight, you know, open exchange of ideas, um, uh, civic engagement at every level, um, and, um, and respect for people with whom we disagree. The Eagleton Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan research unit of Rutgers University. We thank the School of Arts and Sciences for partnering with us on the content of this episode. This moment in democracy was made possible in part by the generosity of Eagleton supporters. To support our work, click the link in the description. Learn more about the Institute by visiting eagleton.rutgers.edu, signing up for our emails, and following us on social media.